Revival service. Stand and join me, page 414. You know it. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. 414, 414, first, second, and the last verse. Sing and stand if you're able to. On the verse. Here we go. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from. me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Verse number four, just something glory land will live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. The song of speed and praise with that and sore, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven is not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Amen, everybody. Praise the Lord. Great singing. It's going to be great to get to heaven one day. Amen. Now, what, as Brother uh, Jacob said this morning, we're not trying to go tonight. Amen. I, I hope nobody goes to heaven tonight, but. If the Lord were to call us home, boy, it would be a wonderful, wonderful thing. I'm glad this world's not my home because this world is pretty messed up. Yes. Pretty messed up. And Brother James and I was just talking about the this just the state of our country and the way people think um, nowadays. And so I'm happy that this is not all we have to look forward to. Uh, thank you for being in church tonight. We had a phenomenal morning today. Um, of course, we had our guest preacher this morning, church planner, Brother Jacob Berry, and his dear family planting a church in Maine. And we had a wonderful attendance. We had two first-time visitors, and uh, Timothy and Ryan, your, your dad, was here with us this morning. That is a long-awaited answer to prayer, whether you know it or not. And so the Lord was very good to us. Um, wonderful time and eventful service uh, for the nursery department and had all kinds of excitement back there this morning. And I'm excited. I'm excited for this revival, and the Lord has already given us revival. I was so glad to see one man baptized last Sunday night. Um, another young man baptized on Wednesday night, and so I'm excited to go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and all that the Lord's going to do. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to pray. We'll be seated, and Brother Philip will come and give us our hymn history. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much, Lord, for the promise of heaven. And Lord, we look forward to it one day that you have that mansion prepared for us, Lord, the streets of gold, and to see your face, Lord, the greatest of all. Lord, I pray you bless our service tonight. I pray you give a special blessing on everyone who's made the effort to come to your house tonight. Lord, may your Holy Spirit work through the singing and the preaching and touch and convict our hearts, Lord, in just the way we need it. Lord, be with Brother Jacob Berry as he has by now already traveled to his second meeting up in Virginia. I pray that you would be with him tonight. Provide his needs. Provide them a church building, Lord. One of the uh, greatest prayer requests they have, Lord. We thank you for men and families just like them, Lord, all across America that are trying to do your work. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Man, well, good evening, everybody. I'm going to get this uh, station set up real quick. I want to bless the song before I do that. Just understand that this song, and you'll see intentionally, um, it went away from what we use as the King James Bible, and they made it more melodic. It had a different type of approach to the song. However, it is in our hymnal. So I will read it from the scripture. So go ahead into your Bible, or excuse me, your blue hymnal. Go to page number 591. 591, but yeah, you can go ahead and open your Bible to Psalm, Psalm number 23, as well, if you want to. Now, the Lord's my shepherd, we all know that song. It's actually dated from 1650, the song, that is, the hymnal. David was way before then, obviously. 
Um, the song is actually one of the oldest hymnals. It's actually in the book of Psalms. Christians throughout history have wanted to obey uh, the biblical injunction to praise the Lord using psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs as given in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, 19, as well as Colossians 3, 16. John Calvin, quoting Augustine, wrote, he wrote down, We shall find no better songs nor more fitting for the purpose than the psalms of King David, which the Holy Spirit spoke. And moreover, when we sing them, we are certain that God puts them in our mouths to use, as if he himself were singing in us to exalt his own glory. But the Psalms were originally written in Hebrew, and when translated, they don't typically have the rhyme or rhythm for easy singing. In the early 1640s, Francis Rouse, I'm not French, I do not, I can't pronounce that, Rouse, an English Puritan rendered all 150 psalms from the Hebrew into metrical English. The General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, meeting in Edinburgh, took Ruse's translation and submitted it to revision committees. These committees spent six years comparing the metered psalms with the original Hebrew, seeking to develop a singable translation that was accurate to the original Hebrew, they worked as painstakingly as if created a new translation of the Bible. Finally, in 1650, the Scottish Psalter was released and approved for congregations of the Church of Scotland. Its full title was the Psalms of David and Meter, newly translated and diligently compared with the original text and former translation. That's a very long title. Yeah. That is a very long title. More plain, smooth, and agreeable to the text than heretofore. Though the Scottish Psalter um, of 1650 is one of the great treasures of hymnody, the only portion widely sung beyond Scotland is its beautiful rendition of Psalm 23, set to the tune Crimin, which begins. The melody Crimin, Crimin or Crimin, was composed of about an edit, 1870, by a woman named Jessie Saremore Irving. She was the daughter of a parish minister in the little Scottish town of Crimin, which is famous for its unusual clock in the church square, the church tower. The clockmaker accidentally put six marks into one of the five-minute intervals, and this gave it an additional minute. So, as a result... Each hour in Crimin is actually 61 minutes long, making a day there 24 minutes longer than anywhere else. And obviously, they joke with it, and they say, well, it just gives us a little extra time to sing this song more so. <laughs> before we do begin, before we begin, I'm actually going to read from the King James, very short six verses before we get to the song. A Psalm of David, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And if you know this you know, by your heart, you can more than welcome uh, say it out loud with me. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He restoreth my, oh, excuse me. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Amen. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, one last thing about this song. All the handles that we have done recently have been pretty weird, at least to us <laughs> and as far as melody. One thing about this song is I hope you're good at controlling your breathing. There is no pauses in this song until the next verse. So just keep in mind, just keep in mind as we go to 591, first, third, and the fifth verse. On the first. The Lord my shepherd. Yeah. 
700 songs in the hymn book, and we're working on getting them all down. And uh, Brother Carl slipped in here. Good to see you, Brother Carl. Yes, and praise the Lord. Well, of course, by way of announcement, we have our revival that is ongoing that started this morning. And so we will be meeting Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night at what time? 7 o'clock. And so 7 o'clock, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, we'll be meeting. Uh, Dr. Jeff Fugate will be preaching Monday and Tuesday night. I'm picking him up from the airport. He's flying in from Lexington, Kentucky. And so I'm excited. He's been preaching for over 30 years. He's the founder and president, current president of the Commonwealth Baptist Bible College. And just to give you a little bit of understanding there, uh, the preacher that was here this morning, Brother Jacob Berry, is a graduate and is a product of the Commonwealth Baptist Bible College, starting a church in Maine. Uh, Brother Andrew and Caitlin Merritt, we support. They started a church already uh, up in uh, Del Mar, New York, outside of Albany. And that church there, again, is a product of the Commonwealth Baptist Bible College and thus Brother Fugate's ministry. And so I'm thankful for him. He's written many books. He's bringing his book table with him and a lot of good books and music CDs that you could get from him. So he's going to preach Monday and Tuesday night. We'll have testimonies each of those nights. All I can say is if you come Monday and Tuesday, please come early so that you don't have to stand. And uh, we've invited other churches. And so probably, Lord willing, Monday, Tuesday, it will be packed. We'll have extra chairs set up. Wednesday night is going to be a special night of the revival. And we're having a gospel sing-off. We're having five four or five, I think five uh, music groups from our church sing, and two of them are groups that have never really sang here at the church before. I don't know if that's good or bad. Maybe there's a reason they've never sang, but we're going to be singing nonetheless on a Wednesday night, and then also we'll have the message on Wednesday night. We're doing a food fellowship after church, and I have a sign-up list if you would be willing and able to help bring something. We're sort of finger foods and some snacks we're going to do after service. Somebody called me this afternoon and said, Pastor, we want to bring 48 uh, sliders, like little slider sandwiches. Can we do that? I said, let me pray about it. Yes, you can definitely do it. I didn't have to pray long. And uh, so they're going to bring those on Wednesday night. But I do have that list if you'd be willing to help. That would be a blessing. And I'm excited about it. I feel the Lord has already given us a great revival. It's just going to get better and better, gooder and gooder. And I'm um, excited Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. Hey, pray about coming. Maybe all nights of the revival, or maybe if you could commit to one of them. And I'm really, really looking forward to that also wanted to, um, in a minute we'll get to the offering time, um, but wanted to thank the church for your faithfulness in giving to the work of the Lord and in giving to missions. Um, as we talked about for the last couple of weeks, Brother Jacob Berry, we took our missions account and we uh, wrote him a $500 check as a love offering. On top of that, we took care of his travel expenses, so we, we took care of him coming here. It didn't cost him anything. We uh, took him out to dinner last night, took him out to lunch today, but all of that, you know, all those things that we're doing for their family is a result of the giving from the church people. And so when you're giving to missions, you are helping families like the Jacob Berry family go somewhere else and start a church just like Elizabeth City Baptist Church. And so I want to thank you for that. We also had some extra money come in this morning, so we were actually able to cover his expenses and give him a, a total love offering for $600. And I just want to thank the church family for that. We have another missionary coming uh, for the Chris Falker family. That's going to be at the end of the month. More on that next week. Also, next Sunday night, we will be observing the Lord's Supper, and that's the thing we do four times a year here at Elizabeth City Baptist Church, and uh, the Lord's Supper is for people that have been saved and that have been baptized. You don't have to be a member of this church to partake of it, but we encourage you, of course, to be here next Sunday night. We'll do the Lord's Supper, and praise the Lord for that. We'll go ahead and take up our um, offering, and let's just, we'll do one offering tonight. Timothy, if you come on up uh, for the offering time, and... Um, I think, yeah, we'll, we'll cover that in just a minute. Thank you, Brother Timothy. And our giving verse for this month is 1 Corinthians chapter number 16 and verse number 2. The Bible says, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And also, as I mentioned this morning, thank you for helping with the hymnals. We ordered 19 brand new hymnals, and my phone says they're going to be here Tuesday. So maybe they'll be here just in time for the revival meeting on Tuesday, and I'm looking forward to that. Don't mind the children that run across the building. It happens all the time. Brother Timothy, please pray and bless our offering. Thank you. Dear Lord, thank you for gathering us here for a Sunday night spring revival, Lord. It is such a blessing for me to be here and for everybody that came, Lord. And it just shows that they're they're more excited than uh, they're, they're more excited than to be here, Lord. And it's great. I'm so glad my father came to the revival, Lord. That meant so much to me, Lord. And, to even hear him sing in a blue hymnal, Lord, it made, it made me tear up, Lord, and I was just so happy, Lord. Amen. I was thankful for everybody that came tonight, Lord, and 
pray that this sermon will teach us something new and that will love us up, love up on us, Lord, and we'll put it into our daily lives. And we thank you for all you have done, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 that I'd like to sing tonight and it sort of goes with the message and uh, hope it'll be a blessing to you. Yes. Because of sin, but these are the same. 
going to take your Bibles to Lamentations chapter number 3. Lamentations chapter number 3. My brother in the third row in the blue suit, you look very familiar. Do I know you? Okay, I, I knew you looked familiar, and I hate to call you out, but I knew you looked familiar. I can't remember if I saw you back when I was in prison or not, but uh, I'm just talking. Lamentations chapter number 3. Praise the Lord. The reason I was in prison is I was visiting Brother Philip, and uh, <laughs> let's just stop right there. I'm joking. I'm joking. Amen. Woo! Praise the Lord. I don't want to know everything about everybody, because sometimes you find out stuff you wish you didn't know. Lamentations chapter number three tonight, and I'm going to pull a phrase from one of the verses here, and we're going to, I'm going to preach about it tonight, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you, something the Lord has laid on my heart. And I believe we need to hear it. If I didn't believe it was needed or helpful, I wouldn't bring it to the pulpit. Lamentations chapter number 3 and verse number 48. The Bible says, Mine eye runneth down with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people. Mine eye trickleth down and ceaseth not without any intermission. Verse 50, To the Lord look down and behold from heaven. And then verse 51, see this please. Mine eye affecteth mine heart. Because of all the daughters of my city. Those first five words, if you're an underliner, you can underline that. The Bible says, mine eye affected my heart. Now look up here for me real quick to help us understand. And I don't want us to forget that half of the verse. Take your finger, point to your eye, say, mine eye, mine eye, eye affected my heart. And so God is drawing a, a conclusion here that what we receive into our eyes is what gets sent eventually to our heart, and it has an effect on our heart. And so if you don't remember anything for the message tonight, I want you to remember that phrase from God's word, mine eye affected mine heart. Maybe you remember the song that you used to sing in, uh, in junior church or in Sunday school, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above, he is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. You know, there's a lot of other verses. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. And you could go all the way to the feet. You could go, you know, I mean, it's, that song goes and goes and goes. But we're to be, it's reminding the children to be careful what they look at. You know, if we're not careful as adults, we will say, well, you know, the children need to watch what be, we need to make sure the children don't watch anything that's not right or that would influence them the wrong way. But let me tell you, that doesn't change when you get to be 18 years of age. You don't suddenly get to this stage where nothing affects you and everything's okay to look at. There's no distinction in the Bible. Hey, as adults, we could sing, oh, be careful, little eye, what you see. Why could we say that? Because the Bible says, my eye affected my heart. Now, it, is, it, is, it goes without saying that children are more impressionable than adults. For example, a something graphic, an image, or a traumatizing experience will probably have a greater impact on a 10-year-old child than it would on a 30- or 40-year-old adult. But we're talking about the difference between right and wrong. And we're not looking for any kind of justification to get away with doing something wrong. We want to do exactly what God has told us to do. And God says, my eye affected my heart. The context here, the book of Lamentations, we have the great prophet Jeremiah, commonly referred to as the weeping prophet. The great prophet Jeremiah was living in a time where in the city of Jerusalem, and the Jewish people in particular, were being punished by God for the years of disobedience and rebellion. So when you read through the books of the book of Jeremiah, but especially the book of Lamentations, this is not a high point in Israel's walk with the Lord. This is not... King, this is not King David, okay? This is not the early years of King Solomon. This is year after year of disobedience and rebellion, and now God is having to bring the punishment upon the nation of Israel. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 51. Um, as, the, as we read the book of Lamentations, by definition, the word lamentation means an expression of sorrow. It means cries of grief or the act of bewailing. So Jeremiah the prophet, under inspiration of God, moved by the Holy Ghost, chose to title this book, the book of Lamentations, a book where he is expressing his sorrow in every single book, or in every single verse, a book of the Bible where he's expressing a cry of grief, he's bewailing in every single verse in this short book of Lamentations. And as he is seeing what is happening around him, 
he makes the profound statement, my eye affected my heart. What does that mean for Jeremiah's sake? Well, as he's seeing the judgment of God upon the nation. This is right about the same time the Babylonian Empire came in and they destroyed the people of Jerusalem. They destroyed the city and they carried them captives. And he, if not during this time, right after, is seeing all this take place. And um, a lot of people believe that he stayed in the city of Jerusalem after many of the people were carried away captive. There were some Jewish people that stayed in Jerusalem, but they were the poor of the people and they were not the, in the leadership. But he is seeing this. It's causing him to take note. And because his eye affected his heart, what it caused him to do is in verse 49, Lamentations 3, 49, the Bible says, and Jeremiah writes, Mine eye trickleth down and ceaseth not without any intermission, <coughs> weeping uncontrollably. Maybe you've had a loss in the family. You've had something tro so traumatizing that you cried yourself to sleep, and you literally cried and cried until there were no tears left to cry. That's exactly how Jeremiah was at this time. Why was he like that? Um, mainly because he saw the judgment of God upon God's people and it affected him and it moved him in such a way. It's interesting also when the Bible says, my eye affected my heart, that is not just referring to Jeremiah. You say, well, Jeremiah was like that, but I'm not Jeremiah. No, this is the word of God making a direct statement. Jeremiah speaking on the inspiration of God, making a definitive statement. My eye affected my heart. Your eyes affect your heart. What you see affects your heart. You can't justify it. You can't get away from it. You can't outgrow to, and get to a point in your life where your, what you see does not affect your heart. It is a statement in the Word of God. It's undisputable. It's futile to argue with it, to scoff at it, or to reason in a way. My eye affected my heart. Boy, I think the Word of God is trying to tell us we need to be careful, little eyes, what we see. Yes. Um, God's word tells us that what we see with our eyes affects the condition of our heart. And I'm not speaking in a physical way, but in sometimes in a physical way, what you see with your eyes can affect your heart. Some people can be terrified so badly they could even maybe have a heart attack because of a frightening or traumatizing experience. Um, when we see something funny, it makes us laugh. I come to church and I see some of the people sitting here and it makes me laugh. Um, not for anybody out. Um, when I look in the mirror, it makes me laugh. Hey, when uh, we see something sad, boy, ever see something sad, it makes us cry. Um, to me personally, when it comes to sad movies, I'm a crybaby. You know, Old Yeller, where the red fern grows, boy, it pulls my heartstrings. When we get to the end of Old Yeller, we have to shoot the dog. I tell you, if you don't cry, then I don't even know if you're an American. You know, you've you got a heart of stone, but we see something sad, and it just, it just brings tears to our eyes. Um, uh, when we see something scary, it makes us fearful. Maybe you've seen something that has absolutely terrified you. I'm reminded of the story in Matthew where the disciples were on the boat, and Peter specifically, when he went to walk out to Jesus, the Bible says, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. He was afraid because he saw the wind. And if you've ever seen a, a sea or a lake or the Pascatank River or the Chesapeake Bay or the Atlantic Ocean when it's a storm and, and there's craziness on the water, boy, I would be terrified to see that and yet to step out of the safety of the boat. Sometimes what we see makes us fearful. Uh, when we see something confusing, it makes us stop and think about it. You ever see something and you're confused? We were in, I think, a restaurant the other day and we saw someone, something, it walked past us. It had two legs. It wasn't an animal, but it walked past us, and we were very confused as to the identity of this, this it. When we see something confusing, it makes us stop and think about it. Hey, this morning, if you were here this morning, you might have turned around during church and saw this, but when you see the pastor's little son running around naked, it makes us look for another church to go to. And uh, that happened this morning, and um, it, it wasn't Miss Brenda's fault. My son, is he's just a mess. And uh, I, I tell you what, he just uh, decided to come into the service and, uh, you know, praise the Lord. But when you see something like that, it makes you scratch your head and wonder what in the world is going on. I, and we try to tell him not to do that at church. I mean, if this isn't his house. I mean, he's not in the backyard. Tonight, I'm going to focus my message on the importance of what we see with our eyes, because that is what determines the condition of our heart. 
So if we want to have a soft heart towards God, and we all do, or else we want to be in church tonight, if we want to have a heart that is yielded to God rather than fighting against the will of God, we need to be careful what we see because what we see is going to affect the condition of our heart, either in a positive or a negative way. Um, number one, the first thing that we need to see is, and, and let, me, let me explain this after I state it, but we need to see people. We need to see people. Again, the Bible told us, mine eye affected mine. Heart. So we need to see people over and over in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is described as seeing people, and what he saw affected even his heart, and it moved him to act upon what he saw. For example, in Matthew 9, the Bible says, speaking of Christ, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. It doesn't say the disciples saw the multitudes, they were moved with compassion. You say they saw the same people. You see, Jesus could see the multitudes and be moved with compassion. The disciples see the multitudes and say, Lord, what are we going to do with these people? They could be frustrated with the multitude. Two people see the exact same picture, the exact same crowd of people, but Jesus is seeing the needs of the people. Uh, the Bible, again, the Bible says, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. Jesus is walking past this crowd, and Matthew, Levi, he sees sitting there, and he's a tax collector, and he's seen all the people probably in line to pay their taxes. Taxes Probably he's seen the Roman guards that were stationed around the tax collector. Yet Jesus looks past all those people and notices a man who eventually he calls to be one of his disciples. He saw a man named Matthew. Uh, again, Jesus says, but uh, Jesus, and the Bible says, but Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort, thy faith hath made thee whole. Jesus noticed that lady and her need, not only to be physically healed, but to be spiritually saved. Uh, Mark chapter 1, the Bible says, Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw, saw Simon and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. I wonder how many future workers and future disciples we could find as a church, and we could find as Christians. If we would just slow down a little bit and take the time to see people, to see the need, to see the potential in them, to see all that God could do with it. That's what Jesus did. He wasn't just walking from A to B. He was looking for people and the needs of people, and what he saw affected his heart, and he did something about it. Luke chapter 21, Jesus is in the treasury or in the temple, one standing by the treasury, the Bible says, and he saw also a certain poor widow. And, it, and as society would say, an insignificant poor little old widow, Jesus saw her and took note of her. He took the time to notice that poor widow. Again, the Bible says that as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Jesus didn't walk past him and not notice him. Jesus saw people. Jesus noticed people. When I worked as an assistant pastor, my uh, dad, who was my pastor, would constantly be on me and try to teach me how to see people. For example, uh, we had there was a much larger church than, than, than here, and we would come to church, and there's a lot of people and uh, it was my job to be able to see who were the visitors. If we're not careful, we come to church, oh, there's a lot of people, and we talk to one person or two people, and that's all we talk to, and we don't see the visitors. We don't see the other people. And so it was my job to be able to look at a crowd and to see the visitors, or to see someone that hadn't been there in a few weeks. We need to see people, because if we're seeing people, that's going to affect our heart. We're going to love people more. We're going to be more um, inclined to help them and pray for them. Um, if we're not careful, we come to church service after service, week after week, and we're seeing people, we're shaking their hand, but we're not seeing their needs. We're not taking the time to find out their needs. Uh, we're not seeing the hurt that they might be dealing with, whether that's a physical hurt, an emotional hurt, a spiritual hurt. We're not seeing the loneliness that they are struggling with. We're not seeing their struggles or their difficulties. We're, we're there, just like the disciples were, but we're not being like Jesus. We're not seeing the people. Boy, we would love people more. We'd be better Christians. We'd be better neighbors. We'd be better um, helpers to other people around us if we would learn to see people. And that'll get into our heart. If we're not careful, we'll be so concerned with getting out of church early to rush on home that we don't make the effort to spend time fellowshipping with the people around you. Boy, that's so important. Um, today, we were trying to, the, the preacher, Brother Jacob, we were trying to take him out to lunch, and he had to leave here by 2 o'clock because he drove all the way up to Virginia. And, uh, boy, we were trying to get out of here. And people were here. People were talking. 
And then Brother Jonathan came and he left and then came back. He painted all afternoon. And when we came to church, he was just leaving. Just That's why we have the wet paint sign. So as we're coming to church, he's been here all day painting and he's leaving the church. Well, what a great problem. Amen. What a great problem. Hey, let's see the needs of the people around us. We must learn to see the lonely person around us. We must learn to see someone who is hurting. We must learn to see them because our eyes affect our heart and maybe we struggle with loving people we struggle with being kind to people because we're not seeing them we're not taking the time to notice them and what we see affects our heart if we're not careful we can turn out to be like the pharisees in matthew chapter 13 and i'll read this jesus said because they seeing see not and hearing they hear not neither do they understand then Jesus go on, goes on to say, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Sometimes, not physically, but in a spiritual sense, we close our eyes to the people and the problems around us. And we close our ears to the people and problems around us. We do it on purpose because we don't want to be... Um, inconvenience with their struggles. Maybe we have a need at the church, we need to get something done, or maybe there's just a ministry need that we have, and on purpose we close our ears and we close our eyes and we choose uh, not to fill that need. Boy, if we're not careful, we're not seeing people and seeing their needs the same way that Jesus saw their needs. Philippians chapter 2, the Bible says, Look not every man on his own things. But look, that was look, but every man also on the things of others. <clears throat> Each and every one of us on here, we have our own things. Amen. You better get your rent paid on time. Okay? If not, you're, you're going you're, you're to be in trouble. You better pay your mortgage on time. Okay? Uh, you better be at work on time. Um, you better keep your house clean. You better make your meals. And we could go, you, you know, we could go list. I mean, we all have our own things that we need to take care of. And shame on you if you don't take care of your own things. Amen. If you don't take care of your own things, you're definitely going to be in no position to help with the needs of others. But we are to look not only on our own things, but every man, all of us, also on the, what's it say? On the things about what do other people need? Hey, what gives a missionary to a foreign land? What gives him a strong burden to reach those people in the gospel? Well, many times they do a survey trip and they meet the people in that foreign field, whatever country it is, and when they see the people and they see the need, their eyes affects their heart and they have a burden to come back and raise money and they can't wait to get to the mission field to start a church or to preach the gospel to those people. Why? Because they saw the people as Jesus did. They were moved with compassion and what they saw affected their Heart. So we need to see people and see the needs and the hearts of others. Number two, in our eyes and on this topic, we must not look upon sin. I'll say that again. We must not look upon sin. There's no justification for looking at sinful things. There's no excuse for looking at sinful things. There, there's just, there's just, you never get to a point in Christian life where you can handle looking at certain things. Um, reminds me of the, the marriage conference. They had a, a, a joint session, and then they split up the men and the women, and one of the pastors was saying something right on with that, preaching to the men. Again, the Bible told us, mine eye affected mine heart. That means that first, we, of course, we need to see people as Jesus saw them, see their needs and their desires and their hurts. But if we're looking at sinful things during the week, it's going to get down into here. It's going to get down in here, and it's going to ruin our heart. And boy, if we're not careful, we come to church on Sunday, and church is not as exciting as it was last week. And we didn't get out of the message what we thought we wanted, needed, or needed to get out of the message. Well, maybe it's because all week we've been looking upon sin, and my eyes affect my heart, and that sin has gotten down to our hearts, and now we have a heart that is wicked. It's already desperately deceitful, but now we've meditated on those things that's gotten into our heart. The Bible tells us in Psalms, David wrote, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Boy, that's a good principle right there. No wicked thing before mine eyes. Hey, uh, speaking of alcohol, the Bible says in Proverbs, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. When it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. That moving itself aright... I've never heard any other explanation. It's probably the fermentation process of the alcohol. And it's obviously talking about an alcoholic drink. And it says don't even look at it. It doesn't say take a little sip. It doesn't say have it on the shelf. It doesn't say touch it. It doesn't say only at Christmas time or New Year's. It says don't even look at it. Right. 
Because if you don't look at it, you're not going to take a drink. It's impossible to drink something that you're not looking at. And that doesn't mean you should close your eyes and take it and that God's okay with it, okay? But don't even look at it. Don't even look at it. That would mean you can't be around people that are drinking because you're looking at it. You say, well, I was drinking. Well, they were, and you watched them do it. And your eyes affect your heart, and pretty soon you're watching them and you're listening, but you're not doing it pretty soon. You're going to be doing it right with them. God says don't even. It's about time we got back to old-fashioned Bible principles, right. amen? Yes. Old-fashioned Bible living. Hey, remember, uh, go to Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter number uh, 19. And Miss Patsy, you can help Brother Bob with this one. It's the first book of the Bible. I think it's easy so he can find it, brother. Yeah, Genesis 19. Brother Bob can't find it. His wife's not here tonight. So um, we'll pray for you, brother. Genesis chapter 19. On the topic of looking, looking and saying, go ahead and have a seat for me, hon. Go ahead and have a seat for me. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse number 15. And we'll hop into the story here of, of Lot and running out of Sodom. Genesis 19, 15. The Bible says, and when the morning arose... Then the angels hasten Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife, thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Verse 16, And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. Verse 17, And it came to pass, when they brought him forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Why did the angel say, don't look back? Because your eyes affect your heart. Okay? And so had they had Lot and his wife and all of his family turned and looked back at Sodom, it would have affected the heart, and they would have went back to Sodom, even though he was getting destroyed. Well, you know who looked back. Verse 26, the Bible says, but his wife, what's it say? Looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. I believe probably once she turned around and she looked at that, that I affected her heart. And in that instant moment, had she not been turned to a pillar of salt, she would have wanted to go back to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Your eyes affect your heart. That's why God said, don't look at the wine when it's red. Your eyes affect your heart. So that's why David wrote, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Your eyes affect your heart. And that's why the angels told Lot and his family, don't even look back. Don't even turn around. That'd be kind of difficult. Could you imagine if your house was on fire and you were running away and you were told not to look back? What's the natural tendency? You get out of danger and what do you do? You stop and you look back and you assess the situation. They were told, don't even look back because God knew that their eyes would affect their heart. Hey, you cannot be, it's impossible to be a spiritual person and watch wicked things on the television at the same time. Say that again, okay? You cannot be a spiritual person, a godly person, and watch wicked things on television at the same time. It's impossible because your eyes affect your heart. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. You will not beat God at his own game. You will not watch these things and put these things in front of you and not let your heart get affected. It's going to seep down into your heart. Boy, I'm thankful for David who took a stand and said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Uh, if, uh, sometimes when my wife and I, if we're out of town and, and we'll be at a hotel, uh, we'll, we'll watch movies at home, but it's, um, it's on the laptop and it's a movie, so there's no commercials, you know, you just, you want to watch, you called us last night, we we're watching Daniel Boone, and it was black and white, and tears have said, uh, where's the colorful one, you know, it was, it was the first season, so it's black and white, but we'll go to, uh, to the hotel, and maybe it's at the end of the day, and we want to watch something, and uh, boy, you know, it just... You know, we don't have a TV, and so we try to watch something. And, you know, it, it takes 55 channels to find something halfway decent. And the filth that you have to look out to flip channel to channel. And then you're on a decent channel that, boy, this is good. There won't be any cursing or immorality on it. And then the commercial comes like, oh, my goodness. You know, what in the world? And, boy, if, if we put that stuff in our minds, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we come to church on Sunday morning and say, God, I need to hear from heaven today. Wow. Boy, we fit, like our eyes affected of our heart. We're so far away from God, it's not even funny because we've set that wickedness. We've been looking upon sinful things day after day. You know, movies, television shows, social media, YouTube, the internet, you name it, reading books, it doesn't matter, putting things that you're looking at, scenes of drunkenness, scenes of immorality, scenes of nudity, scenes of excessive violence, scenes of blasphemy and profanity. I tried to watch a... Um, you, on YouTube, a, a news interview. I really want to see this interview. I was, I was excited to hear this person interview another. 
And I started watching it, and just the profanity that was coming out of his mouth, I, I'm not going to listen to it. I can't. I had to turn it off. I'm not going to deal with that because I know that my eyes, and also my ears, but my eyes affect my heart, and what I watch on the television right. and what I allow yes, these eyes to see is going to seep down in my heart, and I'm going to lose the Holy Spirit's power and God's blessing upon yes, my life. We must not look upon sin because it's going to get into our hearts. Lastly, number three, and we'll be done because Brother Philip's wife made a cake for us uh, for the for the church, but I'm going to get there first, and so you won't be able to get me. Uh, number three, number three, we must look at what pleases the Lord. You know, the Bible. You know, if, if as a Christian, if we take out all the bad and we don't replace it with good, we're going to be an imbalanced Christian. We're going to be a miserable Christian. So we not only need to take out the bad things, maybe that we have looked at in the past. But we need to put new things in front of us, spiritual, godly things to look at so that God will be pleased with us because the good things we see also will affect our heart. Again, the Bible says, mine eye affecteth mine heart. So if we look at bad things, it's going to affect our heart in a bad way. We're getting it farther and farther away from God. But if we look at things that please the Lord, boy, it affects our heart. Now we're closer to God. Boy, now we're excited to be served. Now we're, now we're excited to come to church. Hey, what, what, what things am I talking about? Hey, sing the congregation, sing about the Lord. We sang I'll Fly Away this morning, and I was ready to fly away after that song. And seeing all the kids up here on the front couple rows singing loud and saying amen and praise the Lord and singing everyone, uh, uh, watching everyone sing, that's a great thing that pleases the Lord. That affects your heart. That affects, boy, you want to sing because everyone else is singing, and you're excited about singing because everyone else is excited about singing. Watching Brother Philip as he leads us in song to the Lord and the enthusiasm, boy, that will affect your heart in the right way. Every church service, that encourages me. And that lifts me up and that excites me because he's leading us in song and he's excited about it. Have you ever seen a dull song leader? Oh, oh boy. Every now and then we'll go on vacation or visit in, you know, um, Joe Schmo Baptist Church. We've never been there before. And boy, every time I'm just like, Lord, thank you for Brother Philip and his song lead. I'm so glad you sent him to our church. But what have an excited song leader that's excited about it? Boy, you see that, and you see that on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, week after week, month after month, year after year. That's going to affect your heart. And before you know it, you're going to be listening to the same music that you sing in church. And before you know it, you're going to get to church, and you can't wait for Brother Phil to stand up and teach us that song. Even if it's of a hymn history, and you've never even heard it before, you're still excited about singing. Hey, look at what pleases the Lord. Hey, how about looking at the smiles and hearing the laughter during the handshaking time? Boy, if I don't cut the handshaking time short, we would never get out of church. I mean, I come up here and everyone's laughing and, you know, giving hugs and seeing everybody. And, you know, it's a wonderful, wonderful time. But watching that, what makes you excited to be a Christian? Makes you excited to be in church? Hey, watching the people come down to pray at the altar during invitation. We're trying to teach some of the children, some of our children, some of the children we bring on the van to come down at invitation time and spend time with the Lord at the altar. Because, boy, that's a, that's a way that God will soften your heart when you're willing to step out of a pew and come down in front of everyone and kneel in prayer and spend time with the Lord. Um, growing up, my dad taught us that. And uh, even now, even if we're, if we're out of town, and sometimes you're at a different church, and it's just how it is, and they give an altar call, but nobody comes. We always go, and sometimes we're the first one, uh, you know, and, and that's just how it works. But seeing the children come down and pray, how can that not touch your heart? How can that not touch your heart and put something in there that, that, that can only come from the Lord? Hey, watching people come forward and being led to Christ. Uh, two Wednesdays ago, Timothy brought one of his classmates, and after church, we were able to, I was able to take one of the side and lead him to Christ, show him how to be saved. Boy, that excites you because you're seeing those things, and it affects your heart. It makes you want to bring visitors to church. Right. So that they too can be saved. Good. How about uh, last this past this past Wednesday night watching that same convert get baptized in an ice cold baptistry? <laughs> Boy, that brought joy to my soul. Just seeing him suffer as he went down and seeing him come up just like this. I mean, I mean, I knew the Holy Spirit had him because he was just like that. I'm jealous of that. But but boy, to see somebody get baptized, it's exciting. It's exciting. And what you see affects your heart. Hey, Brother Bob, go and soul winner with Brother Bob. And uh, Brother Bob, he's really fast when you go door to door with him. I send our fastest soul winners with him. But boy, it brings joy to my heart, Brother Bob. You've been struggling with, with, with movement and your head go door to door trying to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. That gets me excited because somebody's excited to go tell somebody about Jesus. Watching Timothy yesterday present the gospel to a total stranger and see that man pray and accept Christ as his Savior, it excites me because what you see goes down into your heart. 
Hey, the ladies singing group, they sang for us a couple Sunday nights ago. What a joy that is to see that because watching that with your eyes gets down in your heart. Makes you excited about serving the Lord. I think back in January, Brother Philip, you and your wife getting married after a beautiful and a pure courtship. And that's something rare to see nowadays. Yeah. But praise God for the opportunity to be able to see a God-honoring courtship and a wedding. Hey, to see Brother Arthur normally here every Sunday morning walking into church one short, slow step at a time. His health is not good. He, has, he walks with a walker. He can barely make it in. But still, he's faithful and he comes to the house of the Lord. That excites me. And we could go on and on and on. I say, Pastor, why are you so excited about church? I mean, it's just church. Well, because all this stuff that I see week after week after week after week and month and year after year, it gets down in my heart and it becomes part of you. And church becomes more and more a part of you. Reading your Bible becomes more. So when it becomes more and more a part of your life because what you see gets down into your heart. So if you're struggling with just being excited about the Lord, boy, start seeing some of these things I'm talking about, and it'll affect your heart, whether you like it or not. Hey, we'd all be a happier Christians if we spent more time in church seeing all of these wonderful things. Boy, when I come to church for one service, boy, my heart is touched, my heart is blessed. But if I come a second time, boy, that doubles it up. And if I come back for a, for a third dose, I mean, we all would go for a third scoop of ice cream. How about a third scoop of church, amen? amen. Come on back. And get some of that. That even right. Come on back and get some of that. Amen. Hey, we'd be more excited about getting people saved. If if I took you soul winning with me, man, or one of the ladies go with my wife, and you got to see somebody present the gospel and see me to say, boy, that'll touch your heart. That, that excites you when you see that. We'd be more excited about revival. If you come to revival, I try to encourage people to come because for me to you know, talk about how the service was. I mean, it's good, but it's just not the same as being there. To stay home and watch the service on a recorded phone or something, it's good, but it's not the same as being there. Mine eye affected my heart. Let's say that with you. Ready? Mine eye affected my heart. So we need to see people, not just see them on the outside, but try to see their needs. Try to not be so consumed with our own life and our business that we don't have time for the needs of others. Be careful not to look upon sin, and we must look at what pleases the Lord. We'll take out the bad and substitute the good, substitute the godly things. We'll see it so much, it's going to get down into our heart, and it'll make us better Christians and happier people. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for tonight. Lord, I thank you for just a short little verse in Scripture. And Lord, you do not require very many words to get your point across. And we thank you for giving us that verse in, Jer in Lamentations. God, I pray there may be some of us here tonight, and there are some things in our lives that we regularly look at that are not pleasing to you. And Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would deal with us about these issues, Lord, whatever they may be. And I pray that we would make the necessary changes, and from this point out, Lord, be more careful and guarded about what we see with our eyes. Lord, I pray that we would see the needs of others. And Lord, I pray that when people come to this church, that this church would be a hospital for hurting people, and that each and every one of us would be looking for someone else to be an encouragement to, looking for somebody else to be a blessing to. Lord, I pray you bless this invitation. Help decisions to be made that honor you tonight. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand if you're able to. In just a minute, my wife will play the piano, and as the piano plays, let's spend time with the Lord at invitation. If God's spoken to your heart, feel free to come down an old-fashioned altar or pray at the chair where you're at. Our eyes affect our heart, and maybe the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart about something that you have seen or have been watching, seen, I don't know. And you're going to try to not let it affect your heart, but it's going to. The devil's going to try to deceive you. The devil's going to try to tell you it's not a big deal. The devil will say, well, that's just that preacher's opinion. It's not that important. God is not mocked. What you see with your eyes will affect your heart. Maybe you could make a commitment tonight to substitute some of the good things, seeing more Bible, reading your Bible, spending more time in the Lord's house.
praying, Lydia? Okay, she's all, all, all back oh, there. Oh, fine. I'm looking for something. It's not here. That's fine. Um, who has your song seats from this morning? Are they not up here? There they are. Okay. If you do not have, and you did not get one of these sheets, come here, Ryan, real quick, real quick. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. You're going to need one, so don't be shy. All right, real quick. If you got your hand up, take one. Um, keep this with you. This is our closing song for the revival. So after every service at the end, hurry up, Ryan. Quick, 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 quick. Pronto, pronto, muy pronto. After every service revival, we're going to close in this song, and it's going to be stuck in your head, and it's going to help you. Amen. Brother Philip, come on and lead us. Yes, sir. The sun is coming up. Starts on the first once again. Here we go now. And once again, I'm missing ten.